What's happening, man? I'm chilling. How are you guys doing? Great. <laughs> Life is good. Life is good. So uh, tell me, before we get into uh, a little bit of these college sports, you've got uh, your own show going, Sports Talk 805 there in Santa Barbara. What's what's happening with that? Well, what happened was uh, once I got it started up at the Santa Barbara Channel, um, matter of fact, when uh, you got me started over there, you know, they were called on uh, KCTV at the time, and then they since changed their name to Santa Barbara Channel. And I went back on over there starting last year in September. And everything's been going pretty good. Getting a good feel of things and uh, we're just rolling right into it. So everything's good. And so we'll just keep it rolling. All right, Dre. Well, let's go ahead and... Uh... You know, as I told everybody, we were, you know, we were doing the show for a long time there, and now you're doing your own thing. But one of your passions was always college football. I know that. Now, college football. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, the dark side of college football a little bit. We were talking about uh, Terrell Pryor, and how do you see that situation there in Ohio State with him having tried to? And it was pretty obvious he was trying to circumvent the policies there with. Uh, with declaring for the supplemental draft, not facing that uh, five-game penalty is supposed to face for the, the sanctions against Ohio State. How do you see that situation? Well, first of all, if, uh, if, if, uh, NFL is trying to save face with this. I think, uh, as you know, I always talk about the NCAA, um, a complete cowardly act, in my opinion, because, first of all, they knew all this was going on before Ohio State was even going to plan that Sugar Bowl. And the NCAA, in their greed, the way they are, let all those guys under all those violations still play because they wanted the money. So it's kind of hard for the NCAA to preach to kids, punish them, and punish the university, you know, let the coaches run free. That's the biggest problem I have with all of it. I mean, you can't be in one way and then all of a sudden be another. And that's one of the main things we have going on in college football right now. I'm not excusing what uh, Mr. Pryor did. The young man owned him to his mistakes and hopefully he can move on and learn from it. This is really deep in the NCAA, Charles, and you know that. It's, it's far deeper than Mr. Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Now, one other thing is I, I've always talked about is that, you know, and we can, we can actually move on to the University of Miami situation as well because this kind of covers everything, and that is what about the fact that you have the NCAA, now the players are under the uh, iron fist, shall we say, of the NCAA, as are the schools, as are the coaches, athletic directors, everything else, but agents are kind of allowed to run rampant. And now as we put uh, Vince Wilfork up here on the screen, there's been that situation in Miami that's come to light. Uh, what, is, what do you think about that? Well, again, it's, it's kind of tough to really nail down all the people who are doing wrong. There's so much money coming into the NCAA now, just like the pros. You got billions of dollars in the NCAA. You got about 110 major Division One teams, I believe it was 105 last year, it's kind of moving up a little bit. And the problem is just major. I mean, once again, you can tell these kids, you know, I want you to come to my university, and in some ways, you're pretty much slaving these guys out, and then saying they can't have any of the money when they don't make money for that university. Now, I'm not saying that they should have a lot of money, but you got to give them something, or otherwise, it's going to keep going, and it's going to get totally out of control. So... I look back at the hypocrisy of the NCAA once again. You know, you talk about Miami and yes, punish the people who have done wrong, and not just the kids, the grown-ups also. But you can take it back to USC with what happened with Reggie Bush and all that. And not one time in the history of the NCAA have they ever given back one nickel of all the money they have made off those universities once they slap on a probation tag. So that this hypocrisy at all time high. I do not believe Miami gets the death penalty. Okay, and you know, when you talk about the, uh, we have now Frank Gore, who is a former Hurricane, and also Kellen Winslow Jr., uh, former, hur former Hurricanes, up there on the screen, as we continue with Mr. Andre Ritchie. Now, well, so what do you do about this whole situation? Do you think it's something where maybe uh, the Fed needs to step in? Because you have the NCAA, which cannot really punish the agents. The agents have these runners, so there's too many guys in front of them willing to fall on their swords. So what do you do to level that playing field? Because even if the NCAA was not, you know, if, let's just say they were trying to do the quote unquote right thing, they still do not have, they can't punish the agents because the agents are not breaking any actual laws. Well, it is a tough question. Um, 
pretty hard to answer that one, but I'll start with uh, maybe taking a model of um, college baseball, like, you know, they put a farm system in a players at a university. They can move to that team, like, let's say the Detroit Tigers, let's say the quarterback that played for University of Nebraska. Got a good right arm, so he signs a contract with a major league baseball team, and he goes and plays for them in the farm system, but he gets paid for it. I think because it's amateur athletics, so it's football, maybe you might have to take a look at that now. Believe me, it's on a, a much grander scale of billions of dollars, and I don't know how you'd work that out. But to me, there has to be some kind of sliding scale, or maybe a flat rate for all players that come to these schools. And I would even go as far as to say, when the player does go to that school, and they give them a stipend of money, they have to have at least a writing that the player has to graduate, because their education is what everybody's missing. So once the player signs a deal with, like, let's say, University of Florida, and we're going to give you, like, let's say, you know, 1500 a month, that, whatever. But you have to graduate. Whatever courses you take, you must graduate from this university also. Because education is being swept under the rug. We're just making money. That throws up to me. That's one of the things that would be major first. I don't care how good the player is, you know, what kind of dynamite player he's going to be for my team, and how much money he brings in. You have got to get your education. There's, there's no excuse for ignorance. Well, it's true. Now, that's one thing, but, well, um, I've always said that, too, is, is uh, something that gets focused on is the, the possibility of a pro career and the, the whole thing of actually getting a degree, a free degree is what you get, is secondary. So with that, with that in mind, though, um, should, should the focus be taken off of, you know, whether or not the players get paid and just look at the fact that they're getting a free college degree, which actually makes them more competitive in the workplace, if for some reason they wind up with not a pro career, which is what happens to most of these guys. Well, you know, I agree with that. That's where you know, there's got to be some kind of compromise. You know, some players are going to make it. We know that. There's lots of them who won't. That's why the education is very important. But the NCAA can no longer sit up here and exploit the athletes to the extent that they are. I'm sure you've seen some of the shows like on the Fab Five, how they're getting exploited to no end. And I'm not saying I'm against the NCAA. I'm against how they want to take everything from the players who are making a lot of money from this university. And then if an agent just gives them a damn tic tac, that's like a one game suspension. <laughs> that's the stuff that, you know, with the NCAA that's just ridiculous. Tear up the whole playbook. The whole rule book, tear it up, start from scratch. All right, well, yeah, you have, well, I think that's one problem is that you have rules that were in place way before the NCAA became the multi billion dollar, shall we say, billion dollar organization that it is. They say millions, but whatever. And they're still operating under under that premise. So, you know, maybe there's time for some of those dollars to get spread around because as, as football and as, as these college sports become more popular, the NCAA is taking in a lot more money now than, say, it was in 1970. And a lot more in 1980 than it was in 70, and a lot more in the 90s than it was in 80, and it keeps growing and growing. And when you look at the size of these contracts they have, like for the, the NCAA gets for the Final Four. Uh, so is, do you think that paying the athletes, is, is that any, do you think that's really a solution? Well, I think it's one of the solutions. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's many parts to the solution. That's just one of them. I think it would, it might weed out some of the, crookedness that goes on, a lot of the crooked agents, it might weed them out if you legalize the thing. I mean, that's how I'm looking at it, but it's a process. It's not going to be something that's going to be done overnight. But again, these players, you know, for every kid, these, these players are not they see the big money rolling in. And the university and the coaches pretty much, to a degree, have to tap dance on that tightrope because the regents and the boosters put pressure on you to win. Yet. They want you to win at all costs, but they don't want you to get busted. And the coaches are just, you know, they're caught in between because they got to play the game. They got to tap down. They got no choice. Because if they don't get the recruits and they don't put out enough money to get more recruits, they're going to get fired because they're not winning. So, oh, you know, it's just to the point where, you know, it has us just start all over. I think you can just rip up that rule book and just start from scratch. So these coaches aren't under such scrutiny. I mean, there's just too much money flying around, as we know. It's just way too much, and the players are onto it. And I don't really know where you start, but um, a sliding skill for these players is something I'd start with first. All right, very good. Now, 
Um, well, we, when you talk about what's what's flying around, and you talk about the money and everything that the coaches make. Well, one thing is you gotta look at this: that the coaches make all this money when actually they are quote unquote teachers. <laughs> when you look at the whole yeah. faculty, and you know the the guy who teaches science may be getting eighty thousand, ninety thousand a year, and then you have a coach that gets paid five million dollars a year because he's coaching a sport, which actually brings uh, you know it brings revenue into mm -hmm. the school. So. One of the movies, one of my favorite sports movies of all time is Blue Chips. And even as long as go as that was made, that's still even relevant today. Yeah, I was, I was strong because people go back and watch that. Because it's all about what's going on today. And they were pretty much on to it back then. And as you stated earlier, it's just like a wildfire now. It's just so out of control that you know, it's hard to bring in the reins on the scene now. It's going to be real hard to bring it in, but is even if they decided that they should give players a monthly stipend or pay them on some sort of a scale, you've still got the third-party boosters who can come in, as allegedly Nevin Shapiro has done, and the school says, well, we don't have control over our boosters, but you've still got a legal activity going on. So even if, you, even if you know, they were to give the college players a certain amount of money each month, it doesn't guarantee that they're going to look the other way when they are, you know, offered hookers or more money or cars or homes for their family or whatever they may be offered. Offer something like that. <laughs> that's another, you know, that's David right there. That's another thing. It's like, well, how do you stop it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, what do you do? I mean, you got an impressionable kid. This kid is a teenager coming from, you know, a run down neighborhood. And got a lot of pressure on his back. He may have a grandmother who's sick. Mm -hmm. uh, the house is behind on payment. The car is in shreds, you know. They're just, they're just in turmoil. You know, they're really hurting. So what is he going to do? If his skills can help his family at that point in time, it's like, say, I'm that player. And you're telling me you're at the University of, let's say, Texas or something, Texas Tech, whatever. Mm -hmm. Andre, I'm going to offer you a thousand, well, excuse me, a hundred thousand dollars right now. That's going to help your grandmother out. You know, these kids are, they can be realistic and think, I may not ever make it to the pros. I may not ever get a big contract. So if someone's throwing money at me now, I better take it. Yeah, and that's what it is. I mean, and it's unfortunate, but and the way our country is structured these days, you know, money is king. You know, church is not even king. Money is king. So when you look at it that way, these players see this. And if it's a, if it's a question of survival or a moral issue, they got to pick a survival for their family. I'm not sticking up for every decision they make, but I understand in that pressure situation what they have to do to get that pressure off the back. Exactly. Yeah. All right, well, you know what? I, one other thing was the, you know, just to, to put a cap on it, the whole Cam Newton situation. Now, allegedly his, his, his dad, who has, you know, that makes it, Cam Newton had nothing to do with it, of course, but his dad tries to shake down, was it Mississippi State, for 100 grand for him to go to that school. And now, are we really to believe that he went to Auburn for free? Oh, you know he did. <laughs> Mississippi State. Auburn outbid them. 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 Auburn outbid them.
the road good and not out here to do their thing, but I'm not going to sit here and knock them off the top of them and bash them. It's been going on for so long. Mm-hmm. It's just now people are talking about it because it's, it's getting out of control now. But am I going to sit up here and say Catholic is the I was right? I don't know what's that. I don't know what their financial situation is. But the man's no fool. He sees all the exploitation going on. <laughs> and if he sees what his son just did for Auburn, you know, who are you or me or anybody? Well, on your show, who are we to say that he's wrong? Look what his son just did for the University of Auburn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, you know what? And let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, SEC and you know the Pac-12, which has expanded and you know again put that influx of dollars into the Pac-12. Not that the athletes will ever see it, but uh, you know we've got that big showdown coming up here. It's going to be in Texas Stadium there, and we've got uh, LSU going up against uh, going up against Oregon. Oregon, of course, played for the championship last year. And the question is, uh, Jordan Jefferson and Les Miles, are they going to be able to get it done? What is, how do you see that game, and how do you see those conferences shaking up as well? Let's talk SEC a little bit with all their high-rated teams. Well, SEC, as you know, with uh, Coach Les Miles over there, uh, one of the great coaching minds of uh, college football, I can even remember this guy was in Oklahoma State. Charles, you know, the biggest Sooner fan on the planet. Boy, this guy would break my heart every time I went to see water. This guy can coach with less talent back then against a good 30 switch coach in college. Now you get this guy over to LSU where he's got all these athletes. You know, and everybody knows the speed of the SC and the closest thing to NFL speed. On, you know, the NFL defense at the top speed. SEC is the closest to it. That's why they're continuing to dominate as we speak one of these championships over and over. Now, I'm going to remind us what Miles of what he's got now. Jordan Jefferson has been an up and down quarterback all the years he's been there. And I know he's in a little trouble with some bar fight, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's going to get out of that. I'm, I'm quite sure with those big games coming up, he'll, he'll find what he's on that field. I think defensively, um, always they're ahead of the schedule. Uh, great speed on defense. They got outstanding linebackers. They play a nice four, four two defense, four two four, two two four, and they just attack. And they're so used to playing speed defense. It's going to be hard for work to get on track early on in this game. But I'll tell you this. LSU better get a lead, and they better get a big one <laughs> if they're going to win this game. Because, of, you know, the other side of the Kelly Coach of Oregon, they got a lot of weapons. But uh, Les Miles, you know, I've got some tricks up his sleeve, but it really depends on Jordan Jefferson and their running game. And maybe even a special team. Special teams, uh, Les Miles can be pretty sneaky. sneaky. They block a lot of punts. We've been looking out for, you know, the first game of the year. Somebody always blocks the front. The special teams kind of lag. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. All right, well, you know what, the uh, the Pac-12, how do you like Utah and Colorado joining the Pac-12 and the Pac-12 kind of becoming, you know, they're going to, looking to become really a power conference. They're going to have their own championship game for the first